Hi, I'm Mary Carr. I'm here with Father Jim Martin at America House in New York City. And it's a very posh Jesuit residence where you walk in and you say, if this is poverty, give me chastity. <laughs> and I'm here today partly to talk about uh, Jim Martin's new novel, The Abbey, which I've read and which even bears my name committing blurbissimo all over it because I found it very moving. Um, it's beautifully written. You're, you're known as an elegant writer. You've written many, many other books. Tell me how you came to stumble into fiction. Well, I, I never set out to write fiction. In fact, uh, I have friends who are fiction writers. One of my good friends is Ron Hansen, uh, who's yeah, uh, author of Marriott and Ecstasy. And I used to say to him, how do you write fiction? How do you sit down and, what do you just say, once upon a time and think up a story? And he would talk to me about his process, and it never really clicked. And um, a few, about a year ago, I had a dream, uh, believe it or not, uh, yeah, that just came to me uh, with three characters. Um, Anne, a 40-ish woman who's just lost her son a couple years before. Uh, Mark, who's a handyman who lives up the street. And uh, Father Paul, who's the abbot of a Trappist monastery. And this story came into my mind, into my dream, full-blown. And I woke up and I said, you know what, that's a great story. And I wrote it down. Now, did, I'm curious, mm -hmm. I'm very curious about this, because I know God probably likes you better than me, and I've never had that. anything in a dream. <laughs> so I, I resent it a little bit, but <laughs> could you see their faces? Yeah, it was very impressionistic. Uh, I, I had uh, people in the dream, uh, for example, Mark was Matthew McConaughey. That was the person in the dream. Yeah. Uh, so Father, you're already casting the mm -hmm, movie. He's a little too old now, the old, younger Matthew McConaughey. Uh, Father Paul was someone I know, who I won't say. And Anne was someone I know, who I won't say. But they had names. The Abbey, where it takes place, had a name, the Abbey of Saints Philip and James. Uh, and I got up and I forced myself, it was like two in the morning, to write it down on a you know, little notebook that I keep. And um, I woke up the next morning and I said, you know what, that's a pretty good story. And I thought, well, I can't write fiction. But I thought, well, I'll try to write a little e-book or something for people. And I enjoyed it. I just kept writing and writing. And it, I enjoyed it uh, even more than some of my other books. And, it got longer and longer. When it got book size, I sent it to my publisher, who had only published nonfiction and spirituality before, and they said, sure. I, I'm, I'm, I'm knocked out. I mean, I, I could not, uh, I found it very moving. I mean, part of the story is about a woman who's lost, you know, first her faith and then her child, and she was a single mom, and this child was sort of obviously kind of the center, the son was the center of her universe and lost in a tragic and ridiculous way. Um, I didn't really know if she was gonna, if she was gonna find her faith. Did you know at the beginning when you started writing, did you know she was gonna find her way? Yeah, the dream was more or less fully formed. Uh, and so I that's what I want to understand. Help mm -hmm. me understand. So you, you knew that... I knew where the story was going. So it was a sort of impressionistic dream and I knew uh, Anne, the woman who lost her son, uh, she rents a house to this handyman who works at a monastery where her father used to work years ago. And one night she, uh, her car breaks down and she says to Mark, will you pick me up? And he says, all right, I have to stop by the monastery. So that's the kind of connection, basically. She runs into this Trappist priest who's very nice to her. She comes back to see a painting that she likes, which draws her. And the Trappist priest and her start having this conversation. And I knew where it was going to end because at the end of the dream, she's happy. So I had the sense of her being happy. Uh, and I did enough, um, I had enough uh, conversations with people. I do a lot of spiritual direction um, where I knew the kind of conversations that would help her to move along a little bit. Uh, and so what Paul and her discuss that helps her find, uh, you know, God in her life, you know, is based on, you know, conversations that I've had and, and also situations I've been in myself, you know, that I've brought to people. So I knew where I wanted it to go, and, and I enjoyed getting there. Um, it was fun getting there. I really, I, I, I'd never written fiction before. I really liked the characters. I sort of fell in love with each, each of them, and they're all on their own journey, too. So I knew where their journeys were going. And you didn't think, could, maybe you can describe for people who maybe aren't, you know, 
Maybe you can describe for people who aren't super knowledgeable about Ignatian spirituality or the spiritual exercises, the notion of hard consolation, which is what I see. Isn't that, is, it, is that what Anne comes to at the end or, or no? Well, uh, Anne has uh, difficulties with her faith because she's angry at God because her son died, which is natural, basically. Uh, and what the abbot does through the book um, is try to accompany her and try to help her see where God is still. You know, despite the fact that her son is dead, God is still a presence in her life. And she's not able to see that. And he invites her to see that in a very gentle way. And so by the end, she's, she's open. Uh, you know, I say at the end of the book, uh, she's not a mass goer, you know, and she's no. not super religious, but she's open and... Um, and she's seeking. She's seeking. And she's very much like most people in the United States who are struggling with their faith, who are, they believe, but they're not sure exactly how God could sort of fit into this messy life of theirs. And she's kind of in every woman or in every person. Uh, how, how many people come to you in direction angry at God? What percentage? <laughs> I know that's a, it's, it's a, it's a personal, uh, very and, personal So question. I have seen probably, I've been a Jesuit for 26 years, I've probably seen in direction, I don't know, 30, 40 people who've come to me, you know, at different points in their lives, and I've had people on retreats, uh, I've directed people in the spiritual exercises. Uh, I think every single person at one point or another in their lives is angry at God. And why wouldn't they be? I mean, you're, you're, you, you get angry at God when bad things happen to you, and it's a natural thing to be angry at God. But Anne kind of feels like she can't be somehow, or she feels like, that, or like, uh, what, I, what is that about? Like they're gonna hurt God's feelings? Well, uh, well <laughs> you know, like, I never, yeah, well, I kinda, you know, I never understood that. Well, like a lot of people, uh, Anne was told by her parents, or at least she intuited from her parents, that you couldn't be angry at God. You couldn't say, the hell with you, God. Uh, or screw you, as she says in the book. Um, but the abbot says to her, you know, that's a really good prayer. And she says, why? My father would have been horrified to hear me say that. And he said, because it's honest. So, you know, the Psalms, uh, how long, O Lord, Psalm 13, the Psalms express our frustration and anger with God, and God can take it. So a good spiritual director invites you to be honest with God, and that's what Father Paul does in this book for her. And I'll be honest, I thought she and Mark were gonna have a little thing. <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know if it was going to go in that direction. Do you, can you imagine a sequel to this book? You know, I was thinking of a sequel. I'm not, I think the sequel probably would be that they, they have a thing. I wanted it to be, for a couple of reasons, one, I'm a priest and, you know, I'm probably... You've got an imagination? Yes, I do, <laughs> right. A very vivid imagination. Uh -huh. But I thought for my first book out of the gate, you know, putting sex in it wouldn't be too cool. But there's sexual attraction between Mark, who's in his 30s, and who's in his... Anne, who's in her 40s, and also the abbot is attracted to Anne. So they're, they're real life people, but I also wanted her to be somewhat reluctant and smart about uh, falling to bed with this guy who she thinks is kind of a frat boy. And she's also- He her, is kind of, I mean, he he's sleeping around. Mm -hmm. he's, he's not, I mean, he's a carpenter. He has that going for him. Mm -hmm. We know other people who've done that for a living. But, um, but he's, you know, he's a little loose. He picks up girls at the bar, right? He does, he does. And she's smart enough to know, uh, you know what? My husband uh, was kind of irresponsible. Uh, I'm dealing with the death of my son. I don't need that right now. So she's smart in the book. But there is, you know, sexuality is part of everyone's life, and so that's in the book. But they do not, I don't want to give away any plot uh, secrets, but they don't sleep with one another. But did the, would a, if you were, to write another novel, which is obviously what I, I imagine you doing this. I think you have a I novel. loved it. I think you If God gives me another dream, I'll do another novel. <laughs> You're so greedy. Where's <laughs> yeah. my dream? <laughs> that's right. Where's, where's my, my dream God? Yeah, where's my dream right, God? Yeah. I know, he gets a dream. I, you know, I'm, oh, I've been well, doing this one. longer. Yeah. Yeah, but still. And your book before this was a, how many pages was that? Was the uh, I think it was 523 pages. Was I was gonna guess 600. I did read it, and it's a marvelous book about Jesus called Jesus. Yeah, clever title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's what it's about. It's actually what it's about. Um, and that must have been scary to write. This must have felt very freeing. Very. I enjoy, I loved writing this. I mean, I loved writing the Jesus book because I love spending time with the Gospels and I love Jesus, obviously, but I really like spending time with the Gospels and pouring through these things and trying to make uh, 
the story of Jesus' life uh, accessible to people. I love that. But there was a lot of pressure because it was... Other you know, people have written about him. Yes, they have, several <laughs> people. <laughs> and you know, you come on one interpretation of a gospel passage and you read something else that says, oh, that's outdated. You know, or one interpretation of some Greek phrase and oh, that's very complica complicated and people dispute that. So I was very uh, careful about getting things right, making things the most up-to-date that I could in terms of you know, biblical criticism. Uh, you know, not wanting to repeat, you know, old things that people have already said. This book, I just, you know, no footnotes, no research, no Greek. Uh, <laughs> no, what, Greek has got to be easier. Yeah, no, what could be better? Um, so I, and I loved it, and I, I loved the characters, and it was fun feeling free and not knowing where it was going to go, and because I, I hadn't promised this novel to anyone, I didn't tell my publisher I, I'm going to write a novel in six months. It felt very free. It felt like a lark, and I, I loved doing it. And did Ron Hansen help you at all with this? <laughs> well, there's a funny story. Uh, I sent the book to Ron, and I said, now Ron writes, um, you know, you have a certain uh, style, like a beautiful style. Ron has what I would call a very kind of poetic style. And to get myself in the mood, uh, I read two books I really like, uh, The Old Man and the Boy um, by Robert Ruark and Marriott and Ecstasy, two books that I go back to all the time. And Ron has this very poetic style that I can't do, you know? I mean, he'll say like, the snow was like whatever. If I said it, I have to say the snow is white and wet <laughs> and cold, right? I could describe it, but I can't say it's like something. It just doesn't work. So I sent the book to Ron uh, and I said, um, listen, uh, I'd like your opinion because you're a creative writing professor and you're a friend of mine. Uh, and if you have any suggestions or additions <laughs> that you would like to make, feel free. <laughs> Hoping that he would say, you know, right here, you the should... The snow was like the, the lace on like, my grandmother's shawl or whatever, right? There you go. That's what I could never say. And he wrote back and said, great book, you know, had a few suggestions. No, <laughs> no poetic additions, but um, I was happy for the, the response. Well, maybe you should bribe him. I'm looking forward, I am looking forward to a sequel. If not a sequel, then uh, another act of fiction from you. Oh, Father you. Jim's The Abbey. Mm -hmm.